I'm travelling all round this magical country, playing in small pubs and town halls as I go along the way. I've seen the power of love in List and Varna, and the power of miracles in rural Noch, where a priest convinced the government to build an international airport. Yeah, he gets the crack leg, right? yeah. he just loves that. Right? And he he wants, he's a wannabe Irish person, yeah. I think. <laughs> Tonight, my journey is taking me west, deep into the heartland of traditional Ireland into a world steeped in magic, mystery and music. Folk music, the traditional music, is, is, is the mother of all musics. And then venturing north into a land divided by history. It's the halfway mark of my Irish tour. Before my gig in Galway tonight, I'm taking the opportunity to explore the west of Ireland. I'm travelling to Wackle Island, the largest of the Irish Isles. It boasts some of the highest cliffs in Europe and endless sandy beaches bathed by the crashing waves of the Atlantic Ocean. The stunning beauty of this region is almost beyond description, but I've come for something else. One Thursday night in November 2011, a convoy of trucks crossed over the bridge to Ackle Island. And on the back of those trucks were these concrete columns. The trucks drove up and parked at Joe McNamara's hotel, which is down the hill here. On the Friday morning, they drove up this unmarked road. And then this got erected. The building started on the Friday morning. By the Saturday afternoon, the local council had come and stopped it because there was no planning permission. There was no plans ever seen for what this is meant to be. Joe McNamara left without telling anyone what it was. None of the builders have ever said what they were instructed to do. People from all over the world have come to find out what this is. It's become known as Ackle Hens. There's 30 columns. There's concrete slabs on top. It's a perfect circle. But nobody knows what it's doing here and why it's been built. It's become a modern Irish mystery. We've well, come in now because I usually have a kip, but that's that's why I made this. In I got this. This is a sleep suit that you get if you're having fly first class with Emirates. Just explaining it, because most of the world will never get one. But I got upgraded. So I'm going to get my wear out of it because it was for nothing. I've literally got 20 minutes to get ready. Lovely. So. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. John Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. This is the second gig I've done in Galway. Ever. You were not. I swear to God. All right, then where was it? That's right. That's right. When I was nothing, hey, and you've had to wait till I'm something till you bought a ticket, you tight. <laughs> this man, see this man, this man's a believer. He was there right at the beginning. It's this type of man that gets an airport built in places like Knock. <laughs> <laughs> Only 4% of the Irish population speak Gaelic, but in this area, its use is widespread. There's even a dedicated Irish language television station. My first experience of the Irish language was when I first started coming over. Uh, and I was down south, I was in a hotel down south, and the news was on, uh, on RTE1. They had the news on RTE1, I don't know if they still do it, and at the same time, they had it on RTE2, and on RTE1 it was in English, and on RTE2 it was in Irish. 
But on the Irish channel, they had the fella in the corner doing sign language to all the deaf Irish speakers. And even I was sitting there thinking, well, how many of them are there? There must only be about four, and one of them's on the telly. It'd be cheaper just to drive round and tell the other three what's going on. I've come to Irish National Broadcaster, TG4, to get a proper understanding of what the Irish language means with weather presenters, Caitlin the Key. Do you believe I can you wish to work it? And Aero McKenny. Ishka Tastal Wolf, Agus Ochter Grainer. Tommy Tiernan actually told me my name in Irish. John. Machanaspic, yeah. Machanaspic. Which is funny because it actually directly translates to son of bishop. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what you said. You yeah, know. Some things never change. Sean Machanaspic. Yeah, Sean Machanaspic. Yeah, the son of the bishop. I like that. So, so you putting that in? Yeah. All right, so that this is now the weather presented by Sean McAnaspey. Yeah, that's it. You'd have to do it in Irish now as well. Uh, <laughs> I'll give it a go. Hvad er det her nok han er her? Er her rain? Rain? Hvad er det her nok han er her? Snøstilke. Good. You sound like a Dothraki. So if you're presenting then on the national channel that 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 supports the Irish language. But you both speak a different version of the Irish. Like you, you listen to Scouts, you listen to Geordie, you listen to Posh London. It's the same language, but they're completely different in yeah. a way as well, and very hard to pick up. It's nearly the same with Irish, although we do use a lot of different words. Back so, so yeah. what, what do you mean by different words? What, what, what would be a different word that you would use? Like it's, it's really interesting because there's four presenters, and we all have different words for for the weather because there's so many different ways to describe. The rain. the rain. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there's so many different words for it. Is that, is yeah. that like the Eskimos have 500 it's, words for yeah, snow or something yeah, exactly, like that? It pretty yeah. much is. It's pretty what much. you, it's, so in Ireland, you get the rain that often. Every yeah. little village came up with its own <laughs> word. <laughs> that says everything you need to know about Ireland. No one puts that in the adverts, dude. They come to Ireland. We've got a hundred words for the <laughs> weather you're going to find when you get here. It was a purposeful British policy as well when you had the penal laws in the 17th century that it, Irish was gotten rid of as a, as a written language. Yeah. It used to be written, um, Old Irish. It was completely dismantled. Uh, they were, uh, Catholics weren't allowed to be educated. So because of that, we lost a written language. Everything was kept in songs, in stories. And I suppose that's, that's the real reason why it's really so important, because we had, we had no books growing up. There was no education. They, the only way they got their history was from the likes of songs and stories. After hundreds of years of persecution, the Irish language is making a revival. The other thing as well, <laughs> when I said to the taxi driver, do you speak Irish? And he said, a couple of fuckers. I don't want, that's a bit much. Yeah. I've, only, I've only asked you the question. He said, no, a couple of fuckers. I said, no, you can't say. And, and that, 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 that saying, I say a few words, innit? And, and then you've actually broken the ice. You know, it's like going to... To France or Spain, and just to be able to to say, say a couple, a couple of fuckle. Fuckle. it does. Because I've had half of that all my life. It's the couple. I, I, I've just put it all in the wrong place. <laughs> couple of fuckle. I've got that. Alan, thanks for your time. Yeah, well, uh, how, do, how do I say that in Irish? Thank you for your time. Gormat fui fui amach halum. Okay, well, thanks for your time. See, just <laughs> <laughs> After the break, I meet an Irish music legend, and I travel to a city divided by more than just its name. My journey around Ireland began watching Mayo in the All-Ireland Football Final. The passion from the Mayo supporters was amazing. Tonight, I'm performing in front of those same supporters, so I've got a special trick up my sleeve. It feels right that I should wear this year. And also, it's just the way we're in the crowd, over putting on the, putting on the county shirt. <laughs> I can't end up with loads of shirts. <laughs> That's it, the gig gets no better. I can literally walk off now, that was the best bit. 
Mayo is an incredible place, an ancient Celtic land. But perhaps the most magical thing of all is the music. In the town of Westport, one pub stands out. The owner is Matt Molloy of the six-time Grammy Award-winning Irish supergroup, The Chieftains. These are just your pitches that, that you've started putting up when you got the bar. Yeah, we played for Barack Obama. Um, and before that, uh, we met President Clinton a few times. Yeah. And he's mm -hmm. a character, he's great. Oh, he's he, he threatened to play a sax with us, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> we might get him yet, yeah. What would you do if Trump asked you? I'd give it a miss. <laughs> Down here, is this the Hollywood bit? You've got Michael Douglas there and Mel Gibson up there. He invited us over for the launch of Braveheart. Princess Di was there. We met her as well. That's brilliant. And, so, and this I loved the most. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the Rolling Stones. The Stones come in to do a session. Rocky Road to Dublin, we did with them. And uh, a rocky road it was that day. We had a lot of fun with them. They were dead sound, yeah. When not touring the world, playing to sold out arenas, he can be found here jamming in the back of his pub. Seek a passage around the People travel here from all over the globe, not just to listen, but to actually join in. Like there's music here every night. I have, I, have, yeah. I have session music seven nights a week. You know, I sort of cocooned it around myself, if you like. Yeah. I don't like televisions and pubs or snooker tables. They're all, that's all banned. <laughs> so, the only time a television will come, into, come in here is when Mayo are playing. <laughs> <laughs> Historically, what role do you think traditional music played? Because we've been looking at the Irish language and so on, it's been having to battle with its own identity because it's been invaded for so long and ruled by a, another country. And yet there's certain things that kept going. One was the Irish language and one was definitely the Irish music. Yeah, I were too thick to quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of saying it. <laughs> Father was there. You play your music, you know. You know, be proud of who you are. Be proud of your music. Be proud of your heritage. So there you go. This is it. This is my last gig in Southern Ireland before I go to do the, the arena in Dublin. Uh, I, um, Sorry. Dublin is in the south. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Listen, it's not a quiz. <laughs> and, like, I had more to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I, wanted, if I wanted someone to finish off my sentence, I'd be at home with my wife. Leaving County Mayo, I'm crossing the border to the north, where things are going to be quite different to the south. Tonight, I'm doing a gig in cold rain. Some of you will love this. When I say some of you will love it, right, let me clarify a few things. <laughs> right, it was easier down south to do a gig. Because down south, I assume everyone's on the same side. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is during the next couple of hours, if I trip over something in the minefield, you don't have to get up and shout at me. We can discuss it later. I'm in a city whose very name is a source of division between the Catholic and Protestant communities who live cheek by jowl in, a place that's synonymous with the outbreak of the Troubles. To find out more about the history of the conflict of this city, from a Protestant perspective, there's no better place in the historic walls of Derry than my guide, Stuart Moore. Yeah. The walls of the city date back 400 years. Now, they were built because King James I of England wanted a place of refuge in Ireland. 
he was scared of people using Ireland as a backdoor into England. Yeah. They attack it. So I met a guy, um, Stuart, Stuart Moore, who's, uh, who, who's from the Apprentice Boys. And he was telling me, uh, he was telling me that the walls of Derry were built and they were built by King James the First because he thought, you know, he wanted a defence to stop people coming into England via Ireland. So that was the first hard border. And it, hey, see what I did? In the edit, that would be brilliant. As a way of attracting the people to come and build this city, the guilds from London, he said he would name the city after them. So he put the term London right. in front of Derry. In more recent years, nationalist politicians would have always wanted to drop the term London. They didn't want anything British to yeah. do with Ireland. Um, so if someone ever says to you where you're from, where'd you say? I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> um, I, if I am speaking an everyday language in this city, I'm from Derry. If I yeah. am out of this city on holidays, on business, whatever it may be, I'm from London Derry. It's the official name of yeah. my city. As well as curating the museum here, Stuart is a member of the Apprentice Boys, an organisation which commemorates the Siege of Derry, an event where the deposed Catholic King of England failed in his attempt to take the city. The tradition was fascinating, but I have to say, and it was fascinating, and I can understand it a lot more now than I did before, but I've got to tell you this, I was told to him, and I said, well, if you join the Apprentice Boys, is it like, you know, is your secret... And Shake all it's your way of knowing that someone else is in the Apprentice Boys. And he said, no, he said, but we have a salute. The Apprentice Boys have a salute that they use. The salute is the left arm outstretched like this. And that is taken... Like that? Left arm outstretched, yeah. It's obviously not a secret, because I've just told you what it is. Yeah, but, but it's weird, isn't it? Because the, the amount of times, you know, when people might walk up to you and go, what's that over there? <laughs> you know, oh, you mean that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the apprentice boy salute. I said, that must be confusing, mustn't it, when you ask someone directions and they go, it's that way, you go. <laughs> You're one of us. So I went, and I, I went there, and then I went down to the bog side, and obviously they're like, you know, we were on the walls of the city looking down at the bog side, then I went to the bog side, and I learned a bit about the community there. In a city divided by sectarianism, both sides have got incredible stories to tell. And below the city walls, in the Catholic Bogside area, is the story of an event that became known as Bloody Sunday. On the 30th of January 1972, the British Army opened fire on a civil rights march. 13 were killed that day, and another died of their injuries months later. Father, how many dead have you seen in the bog side? Appearing to be dead. There are the three in that Saracen car. There are two men lying at the end of this block of flats. There's another man at least very close to being dead. There's one, there are two others up there. The nearby Museum of Free Derry has become an integral part of Ireland's civil rights heritage. And Information Officer John Kelly has a very personal attachment to Bloody Sunday. William McKinney, that's a camera he used that day. He actually filmed the march before he was shot dead, just outside in the car park. This is my brother, Michael. He was 17 and he was the youngest to die on Bloody Sunday. We're here to ensure that the people, when they leave here, have a better understanding of the story and the truth about what happened. In recent years, the museum has welcomed visitors from all parts of the divide who have come to pay their respects. Remarkably, even Protestant paramilitaries. How was it for you and the rest of the staff? You know, you're saying to yourself, I wonder how these guys are going to react. But to be truthful, total respect. Total respect. Because they knew the story. And we shook hands in the aftermath, and away they went. I've had cross-community groups coming into me, young Protestants, young Catholics. I have Protestant schools coming to me. They're walking around the bauxite, which I wouldn't be able to do 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, so things have changed dramatically here. But a lot of great work going on here, especially in this city, when people are prepared to sit down and talk to each other. That's the important factor. That's the key, isn't it? Talk, talk, talk. And in that spirit of sitting down together, I invited John and Stuart to my Derry gig. What about you?
Well, you know of me, Sturberg. All right, I'm along. Hello, how are you? Thanks for coming. Where, where have you come from? Where am I living? See, now I know I'm in Derry. <laughs> People will tell you the distance, but they won't tell you the direction. <laughs> where are you from? Not far, woman. <laughs> you don't have to know any more than that, there'll be. There'll be no postcodes handed out here tonight. <laughs> Everybody's equal in here tonight. <laughs> if he didn't have a good idea of Ireland, he sure as hell got it when he met the likes of us two. Uh, and everywhere else he went uh, on his trip, he's meeting the people and then going and doing the show. I married a girl from Manchester, obviously. I'm from Liverpool, so my kids are mixed race. So we've had a lot of... <laughs> A lot of issues with that. We've got over it, you know. We crossed the divide. He could only but learn from what what they're talking to us. But um, you, like you must remember also, like we, we are a funny people as well. We can laugh at each other, and certainly after the night, certainly I think John has picked that up, and he, I think he was comfortable in that respect too as well. He was prepared to, to have jokes about so, both sides and so on, and fair play to him. For you. Next time, I go for a chilli dip before crossing the border on my way to Dublin. <laughs>